discovered that uh, 10 years ago to this day, Risto, Risto told me this, 10 years ago to this day, Roger Bonnet was here uh, at the time COSPA president to uh, celebrate the 40th anniversary of, yeah, uh, of uh, the, the uh, Finnish presence uh, participation in, in COSPA. Eh? I am extremely proud to be here today for the 50th anniversary, which is even a rounder number, is even uh, sort of more important. Um, so first, a few world, uh, words, maybe a bit general, still, and I'll show how all of you are, are familiar. Let's see if this thing works. Ah, I had it. No, no panic, no panic. Yeah, <laughs> all right, uh, a course per world. We have a number of countries that are continuously increase, and I'm particularly proud of this. I've been working very hard in the last four, four years to get new countries to come in. Obviously we get our, our strength from the number of countries came, which, which belong to our uh, uh, committee. But and of course I don't have to remind you of the basics still. It's obvious that, I mean it was founded in 58, you, you all remember that, and to promote international research uh, with the idea of collaboration, organizing assemblies. As you know, we have much more than just the biannual assembly now, many other types of meetings um, and publications and many other means, including myself and many others going around in countries all over the world telling beautiful stories about space and above all trying to enthuse young people to do uh, research uh, in space. And we try to, to cover just about everything, which I will try to do very briefly in my presentation today. I, I know I will be followed by people who uh, are more expert in some detailed uh, topics. I will try to, um, to give you a global presentation essentially of all the activities of the commissions we have. You see we have these eight commissions here, they go from the, from the Earth to infinity, and also uh, study uh, the, the biological part of life sciences part. Uh, let, me, let me tell you right away about this. I'm very proud that we now have a new journal. This is the first issue, uh, the first issue on life sciences in space research. You see it here. Um, for the first time, uh, we now have a place where people who do life sciences in space research would go from uh, the health of astronauts, but also many, many other topics, isobiology, etc. Uh, we're very proud that, uh, with the help of Elsevier, of course, COSPA can now can now also also uh, do this, which is this particular uh, commission, scientific commission here. But we'll cover most of them, starting from our Earth. Okay, and this is a recent Earth selfie, as they call them now. Huh? you do like this, you do a selfie of the, of the earth and um, it's a huge challenge, I don't need to tell you here, many of you are really expert, but uh, the important thing is to explore many frequencies of the observation of the earth and possibly to build a, a multi-frequency vision and as you were mentioning Toya, this, this uh, produces a huge amount of data which then requires huge computer power, special software for understanding and, and using it uh, in the best possible way. Uh, this is another selfie, yes, of ourselves <laughs> here. I don't know if you can locate yourselves here. I cannot, unfortunately, but I'm sure, I'm sure you can. Uh, you, we're inside the picture. Yes, <laughs> very good. Okay. Um, so this is a nice example. This, uh, on the other hand, is taken from, from my country, from, from Italy. Uh, the, in, the, in the plains uh, close to River Po, where there are some deposits of, of gas, of natural gas. And, and then people, uh, as, as obvious, pump out the natural gas, but then to avoid uh, crushing of the soil, pump in some gas to uh, keep essentially a, a dynamical balance. And this is shown here. Oops, let me, let me try and show it again because you, you see this is measured in millimeters, there's a displacement of one centimeter for when you pump 
uh, extract or inject gas volume. Okay, this is quite interesting. Eh? It's quite interesting, and it's it's done from uh, one of our um, Earth observation satellites, uh, which monitors let's say this uh, this operation, which is actually not all that obvious. And another example, uh, this is about the seafloor. Uh, I'm sure you can read seafloor from space. This is more a, a more delicate topic because let me point out there's many experts here on the surface of Mars and we know much more about the surface of Mars than we know about the surface of the oceans, namely two-thirds of the surface of our planet if you think about it. Yeah? And the, the spectacular example is this extremely sad and somewhat mysterious stories of the disappearance of flight MH370. Yeah, we have all followed it. Apparently it went down, this is a map of the surface of the ocean, uh, sort of west of Australia, but as you see the scale here is 300 kilometers and the resolution on this map is absolutely not enough to be able to understand something if, if the airliner actually went down here. For example, this blue thing here is a trench which is nearly eight kilometers deep, relatively small, and eight kilometers deep, whereas this part of the floor is two kilometers deep. So you see here the, you see here the scale. You see here the scale. So in an extremely challenging problem, uh, this, this disappearance of this uh, airliner, uh, I think, brought out the problem in itself. In principle, it's, it's possible to, to map some floor, so somewhat the ocean floor because, believe it or not, ocean water uh, does have a little bump where the floor has, uh, the ocean floor has a bump apparently. I did not know it, but, but it can be measured from, from satellites. So I, I am sure, uh, although I'm not an expert, but I, I believe here we have a lot of work to do, seriously, a lot of work to do to get a, a better grasp on the surface of our, of our oceans. Um, but of course, uh, in our Earth, we uh, live close to, to our star uh, and we very much worry about interaction uh, with the <coughs> magnetosphere of the Earth uh, and the solar wind, etc. I think uh, we uh, are in, in, in the region of experts on this topic. I don't have to uh, insist too much on this. I don't have to convince you of the importance of monitoring what, what is now called space weather for a number of, of reasons. I think we're even trying at the level of the space agency at some point to push a program through with some varying degree of success, let us say, varying degree of success. But this country, together with Sweden, several other, Canada, many other northern countries, has a splendid tradition of monitoring from the ground, from balloon and from space, the interaction between uh, the Sun and the Earth's magnetosphere, the several space missions, etc. Uh, this is, is extremely important for us and for COSPA. Uh, COSPA has a commission dedicated to this, of course. But we move out into the sphere of outer space. Okay, this is our home in space, right? the space station. Uh, here we have a number of problems, of, of interesting uh, problems uh, with this object. But first, we have to go there, right? Uh, which is a non-negligible topic uh, since, as, as we know, our American friends have given up on the shuttle and now in order to go, you have to go with the old uh, horse, reliable Soyuz which is uh, still excellent but is based on very old um, technology and of course the, the Russians now uh, have a what 70 million price per seat on the Soyuz. Soyuz, I don't know if you've ever been into one, I have sat into one, it's extremely uncomfortable. And first of all it, it was designed for two astronauts and now they use them for three just to, yeah, so you're really packed inside there and you have to stay two days packed into the Soyuz. One of our Italian astronauts, Nespoli, uh, was a parachutist, a pretty tall guy. <laughs> they had to redesign the seat to allow him to stay. <laughs> it's, it's not... Anyway, it works. 
it brings people to the station but <clears throat> what are we to do with it from now to the conceivable end of life no one knows where it will end it will last maybe 10 years at least uh, I don't know I, it, it's difficult to say there's a lot of politics in this um, do we make it a large microgravity vegetable garden for example interesting how huh? people grow plants in it did you know there was an experiment um, of, a, of a box with a glass cover with uh, 3,000 bees in it, honey bees, to, to see if honey bees build their home the same way in absence of gravity. <laughs> a crazy experiment, but very interesting. The poor bees, uh, I saw the film, the poor bees were flying uh, all askew because they, to fly without gravity for a bee is obviously not done, but still they built their, their homes in hexagonal form, very precise, very accurate. The only difficulty was with the astronauts who were terrified that the, uh, the glass could break and have 3,000 bees into <laughs> the environment of the space station. With it. Anyway, do we do new materials in space? Who knows? We've tried it a number of times. I don't think anything very spectacular has as yet come out of this. Uh, so sort of the idea of something that could have some implications. Uh, do we make it a microgravity research hospital? This is also very interesting, especially in view of this of this new journal. I think there is a, a lot of work to be done in, in that direction, especially as a training for future uh, human missions. Or do, will it become a, a rich tourist hotel? Some people bet on that. Uh, who knows? Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I would like to, to go, but many people uh, I think would we'll be very very happy to go spend a holiday there until they discover uh, what the toilet is like on this space station, right? The usual story. Anyway, um, but let's, uh, let's go um, somewhat beyond this, if I may. Uh, which future for man or women in space beyond the moon? And so I've recently discovered this, this very beautiful book by, by Werner von Braun. The, the, the Nazi, we all know the story of Werner von Braun anyway, um, who gave us the moon, however, eh? who gave us the moon with an overgrown V2, essentially, with the Saturn V. Well, uh, he uh, told the splendid story of how to go to Mars in, in a book that I, it's very difficult actually to get hold of it, but it's a, a sort of science fiction book written by von Braun with a little bit of fiction in it but very accurate technically. It describes a whole fleet of, sheep, of ships which, which actually go to Mars, find the Martians there, picks up one Martian, brings it back to Earth. It's an incredible story written by him. And he, uh, this was written in 49, 1949. At the time, um, knew that the atmosphere of Mars is very thin, and therefore parachutes, for example, are not enough to to, to sort of allow a, a soft landing for a ship big enough to have humans in it. Yeah? And so he thought of a clever idea of, uh, of landing on the polar caps of Mars in winter, there's plenty of snow, so you put skis under the lander and you land on skis like this. Yeah? This is very serious, eh? for Brown did this. <laughs> Who knows, the, the, the snow must be pretty smooth <laughs> if you land very, but anyway. It's a it's a lovely it's a lovely book it's a lovely story I think uh, how, how do we do it seriously how do we do it um, there are a few questions which I would like to share with you now I am a Mars en enthusiast like several others in this room of course okay so if we want to have a future of people in space which target asteroid or Mars which new station, etc., etc. So it is obvious that to go outside beyond the moon, we need a base from which to, to start. It is unthinkable to just go from the surface of the Earth to Mars, for example. So one needs a station, uh, in which I call a, a shipyard, a place where you can assemble your ship that goes into interplanetary space. Where do you want to put it? Maybe L1 could be uh, the Lagrangian point between Earth and Moon, could be a possible place to put it uh, already far away from the Earth, so you can build a, a nuclear propulsion engine here. Maybe go to asteroid first for training, 
and then to mass. Uh, I would propose Kuro as an ideal launching place for, for the moon. Baikanur, for example, is far, far to the north, of course. Uh, we need nuclear propulsion, but we have to still work it out. And which mix of robotics and human exploration do we need uh, to do? The sort of examples of questions that still need to be answered. Some of them are being worked upon, but still need to be to be answered. So, a modern version of for Bravo Vision, a, a book I strongly recommend is this one by Buzz Aldrin, uh, one of the <coughs> first uh, two on the moon. Um, it starts by saying in 1903 the Wright brothers took him into the sky, 60 years later Apollo 1 took us to the moon, and so he claimed 60 years later this is how we land on Mars. Okay, so who knows? Anyway, he has a vision for space exploration. It's not, it's not bad, this book. It's not bad at all. I, I recommend uh, reading it. And he has a vision which uh, sort of goes all the way to uh, 2032, which would be uh, the time that, according to him, we will land on Mars. This is maybe a little bit optimistic, of course. Uh, he is also very careful not to mention nuclear propulsion because he knows that this is not uh, something you talk about in the presence of ladies, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, I, I dare to do it because I, I believe that human exploration for the world as a base camp uh, can be done. And I, I have a, a book here, <coughs> we, we are the Martians, yes? which is uh, sort of inspired by Suntana Mars, by, <laughs> by my friend uh, Risto, um, which explains everything. I, I suggest you, you read it uh, and then you, you understand why we are the Martian, right? So anyway, seriously, we need nuclear energy in space to, if, you want, if we want to, transfer, to transport human beings from the Earth, for example, to Mars or even to, the, to a passing asteroid. There's nothing bad in it. Um, uh, nature has put a lot of energy into the nucleus of an atom. As, as we all know, we, we exist because nuclear forces exist. Otherwise, it would be just a thin soup of protons uh, with no taste. Um, it's, only a <laughs> it's only a matter of doing it uh, the right way. Uh, fission is a process since uh, Fermi unleashed it in 1942, we know it. We know it extremely well. So I think uh, we could we could use it if we were to have uh, in something like this. You can get essentially the problem is to get a, a ship of the size of an Airbus at 50 kilometers per second. This is the essence of the problem. To go to Mars, you need something more or less of the size of an Airbus to simplify matters, but you can put crew and all the tools, etc., etc., um, a bottle of vodka, <laughs> if need be, etc., and, and to get to Mars in a reasonable time, you have to go 50 kilometers per second. And so if you work out the energy needed, there is no way you can do it with chemistry. Please let us remember that ke uh, <coughs> chemical energy the recombination of the water molecule, hydrogen and oxygen, which is the highest form of chemical energy, brought us to the moon, but it will not bring human people beyond the moon if we want to survive, namely not, not spend years and years in space. We need nuclear energy, otherwise we stay home, which is also a possibility. But if we want to go, here for example, this is a mission that I had prepared a uh, scheme of, together with my friend Carlo Rubia, well-known physicist, um, which allows you, for example, to leave the Earth here in an appropriate ellipse, stay on Mars 41 days, which is the right time for a short vacation on Mars, take a few pictures, pick up a few rocks, and then come back in an orbit that goes close to the orbit of Venus. Here there is Venus, here comes back in exactly one year 369 days. In one year, you can do the trip with a nuclear powered energy like that one. Is this science fiction? I, I don't know. I just inspired by Suntan Amas. And um, there are a few principles that I would like to, to, to share with you 
uh, uh, elementary. Uh, we need to create, a, a, it must be a global effort, so a global entity focused to ferrying earthlings to, to Mars. Uh, we have been capable essentially of one major project, the space station, uh, ISS, which was 0 0.2 trillions, about 200 billions over 20 years. Okay, to go to Mars we need to increase by a factor of 10, roughly speaking, in cost, difficulty and, and risk, and to generalize and improve the worldwide coordination and collaboration. The ISS, in my opinion, had its main result in the fact that we've been able to actually build it. Hmm? So put together uh, most of the space power, excluding China, but at the time, yeah, all of the major, the, the really have worked together to build this thing for 200 billion. And this started a long time ago, let's say, at least 20 years ago uh, and more. So, it is not unthinkable to say, let's go a factor of 10 up, um, with a w true worldwide coordination, I think we can do it. Uh, and the, so what we need is this global organization, some sort of operational COSPA. COSPA does not have operational power, but imagine it had an operational power. Uh, the budget is not much. It is equivalent to asking to the billion richer people on Earth, huh? take the, the billion people who uh, are asking to contribute $100 per year for 20 years. You get two trillions. Two trillions is, is nothing in, if you think that it's about and uh, four five percent of the of the expenditure of the military expenditure of the world over twenty years. Do, do you know how much the world spends in armaments per year? One point seven trillions. One thousand seven hundred billion dollars per year per year in in weapons, in armament. Okay? So <coughs> If you look at it this way, you integrate over something like 20 years, which is really the time needed, you cut it by 5%, you go to Mars. I, I think we can do it. <laughs> it's a, okay. It becomes a political, a political uh, problem, of course. <coughs> uh, of course, we would have to leave to national space agencies uh, all their prerogative, and uh, maybe we could make ample use of um, private venture capital, which is also important, uh, with possibilities of future return on investment. I actually have written a book on this uh, a scenario for interstellar and its financing, and its financing, of which I know nothing, as I'm sure you understand, but I had with me Andrea Sommariva, who is a very respected economist, a professor of, of economics, and it turns out it, um, you know, this, is, this is the book, it turns out it can be done. It turns out it can even be profitable. <laughs> so let's think about it. But so what next? Suppose we do this, what next? Um, what, what do we do? What, what essentially, sorry, we can't read it very well. What remains to be discovered in our planetary system by man or machine? Because by now, for nearly half a century or more, we've been, we've been practicing what I call contact astronomy. See, I'm an astronomer for in my lifetime, I have, met, I have witnessed the beginning of contact astronomy, which means to go out and touch human, <laughs> and touch celestial bodies for the first time, which is a non-negligible point. So far you look at through a telescope, but there's a whole world of difference to land on the moon or to bring back a sample, to have something landing on Mars, taking pictures, and practically we have contact astronomy now have explored uh, most of the uh, solar system. And so we have a rather good panorama of the solar system. Uh, either we have or in the process of, of having. I've listed here a whole list, and I'm sure it's not complete, of the, of the missions that are either ongoing. Say, for example, Rosetta. You're all aware that <coughs> in a few months we will have, spect uh, we hope, spectacular views of a, of a comet from close by. We will even taste it. We will even, this object that lands on it and, and, and tell us what the taste of a comet is like is something contact us strong. Yeah? Um, and so we will have completed the exploration, the uh, first exploration of the solar system uh, with its atmospheres and magnetospheres, not, not only the, the solid bodies, but their atmospheres and magnetosphere uh, pretty, pretty well. 
the, the first exploration mm, took about 60 years, uh, which is much less than what it took to explore our own planet, if you think about it. Uh, and we have explored uh, a great part of the, of the solar system. And so I would say, let, let's try and, and see um, what, uh, what we, we, we do if we move on and out. I repeat the talks that we've been following, uh, we're concentrating on some of the missions, but I have one special topic which I would like to, to bring now because it, it's also one that relatively new, of great interest, and it is looking for new planets around old stars, namely, by, by old I mean normal stars, stars that we know exist, etc. It turns out this is very surprising that there's many stars close to the Sun. This is 5, 10, and 15 light years, <coughs> the immediate surrounding of our so beyond our solar system. And there's uh, maybe a few hundreds of stars within 15 light years. It turns out that many of them, by now we have understood that most stars have a planetary system around them. Huh? It, it is not, th this is a very recent discovery in astronomy, of course, not just our own sun, but most stars planetary systems are, are the norm for stars in our galaxy. And we have collected already data on over 1,000 uh, planets, and as we will see, many, many more will be coming. But the interesting thing that when exploring these local extrasolar, extrasolar planetary systems, we have invented something rather elementary, which is called the Earth Similarity Index, mm -hmm. a ranking, an index, which is uh, one for Earth, and then it approaches one, you take a planet and say, is it rocky? Okay, uh, it ha does it have the right mass? Not too big, not too small. Does it have an atmosphere? Does it have a magnetic field? Is it at the right distance from its star so the water can remain liquid, etc., etc. all this. And according to all these topics, you give a score, and in the end, you, you give globally an index, which would be one for Earth, uh, for Mars, for example, is uh, there it is, it's 0 0.66, I don't know if you can read it, 0 0.66. Well, uh, this is the surprise that we have quite a few, uh, these, th these ones, that have very high, this is 0 0.84, 0 0.83, 0 0.79 in this, in this list. And be advised that, um, you know, biologists uh, have done some calculations, and you can have, uh, I'm sorry, the quality is not very good, but, but th let me say that there are at least two and possibly three local planets who have uh, an Earth similarity index greater than 0.8. And 0.8 is the threshold at which biologists tell us that on that planet there could be a reasonably advanced forms of life. Okay. Uh, uh, whereas elementary forms of life uh, are, are acceptable in something greater than 0.7. And there are quite a few w bigger uh, with Earth similarity index than 0.7. Okay, and this is the result just of a few years of exploration. You understand that it's, it's practically sure that very soon we will discover a planet reasonably close to the Earth that has a very high Earth similarity index and then the idea of going to visit it would be very, very strong, in my opinion. In any case, it's a very exciting type of, of research. But, of course, we have to cover uh, most uh, of the sky, and so I go beyond the local environmental system. And let me talk about this rather beautiful mission, Gaia, although uh, I think someone else will, will cover it, so I just give a flash. It's, it's already... Uh, up and running, uh, and it will c cover just about everything, just about everything in our galaxy. I find it spectacular because by monitoring the, uh, the motions uh, of, of, of stars in the galaxy, uh, we do what Eratosthenes had started uh, two millennia ago, measure the scale of distances from the from two cities on Earth to the Earth, uh, out, outwards towards the whole universe. And in passing, you, you discover an enormous amount of science. It is uh, down to fundamental physics, planetary systems, uh, 
the distance scale, essentially the distance scale. This is uh, a classic uh, experience of European astronomers now. Some of you remember Hipparchus, which was a tremendous success for Europe, even if it had started, uh, many now have forgotten it, but it had started with the wrong orbit, which required tremendous effort in recalculating the, the mission, but it was a great success in the end. And here you see, we go out uh, to cover most of the galaxy. Certainly we position one billion, one billion objects to accuracies that are unthinkable even with the local uh, objects with the Hubble Space Telescope. But I don't dwell on, on Gaia because you will hear more about it. Uh, there is another uh, mission which has now just been selected, PLATO, which is also aimed at, at working on planets, an Earth side planet in the habitable zone. The habitable zone is the right distance from the star where the temperature of the surface of the planet is compatible with liquid water, for example, and uh, also super Earth do astro-seismology, etc. This is a huge mission that will collaborate with Gaia and build on Gaia's result. So it, th there is really a, a great tradition in European astronomy in this sense, and these two missions are, are following it up. Uh, but another tradition is the violent universe, the high-energy astrophysics, which uh, is my own specialty, uh, X-ray and, and gamma-ray astronomy. We have done a number of missions, as you, you know very well. XMM and Integral are now two veterans. Uh, XMM feels like yesterday, but we launched it in 1999, okay, <laughs> which is not exactly yesterday. And uh, I am extremely proud to tell you that we launched it on time and on budget. Fifteen years later, it's working perfectly well and is the most productive mission of its kind. Productive means in terms of paper published based on the data of this mission, which after all, you can imagine I was the PI of one of the <laughs> instruments, which is why. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, what I told you, it's true. It is a great success. Uh, and the same is true for Integral. Integral was launched uh, a few years later, so it's now, what, 10 years in orbit, you know, something like that. And it's also doing extremely well. Uh, then there are uh, NASA missions that are equally good, SWIFT, uh, NUSTA and Fermi, uh, Suzaku, Agile is the Italian mission of which we're also very proud. It was launched in 07 and it's still working fine. So I think we have a, a good coverage. Um, we, have, we are adding the ground-based dimension now using extremely high energy gamma rays that are practically impossible to catch with a, with, with a satellite because satellite is too small. So you do it on the ground where you have greater collecting area. <coughs> the only difficulty here is that all these missions have been going, except for NUSTA, have been going for many years, and um, tomorrow does not look so extremely bright. There are uh, a few examples in collaboration with the Russians. Of course, our <coughs> Japanese friends may be in China, and then uh, the uh, Sp European Space Agency has re recently selected the follow-up to XMM, Athena, which, however, will not be launched maybe 15 years from now. Who knows? It's a long time to, to wait. Still, we try to do our best, and we do, again, an improved version uh, Cherenkov Telescope Array from the ground, w on which we also count to, to open up a, a, another new window in the universe. So let's go back towards the beginning of time. We're all familiar with this lovely sort of cosmological synthesis of all what happened in the last uh, 13.67 billion years. And here, one day or another, sooner or later, NASA would manage to launch the <laughs> JWST. It, it's become really a joke now, uh, but it is a splendid mission. Potentially, once it's up there and working, it is, is a marvelous mission. The problem is, the mission ha had gone out of control. We, it looks like as if NASA has uh, brought it back under control. Here we will be able to look back uh, more or less at the, form at the time of formation of stars, or the first stars, roughly speaking, which is something we really uh, need uh, still to
still to understand this beyond the ultra deep field the first stars and the first galaxies we have not seen yet okay we have not seen yet we have uh, still a part of the universe which is unexplored from the microwave background which is when the universe was 380,000 years old to uh, the deep field which is when the universe was maybe 400 million 400 million and in that period however is an extremely critical period because the first stars formed and assembled in galaxies they were different from the sun first stars they were built out of hydrogen etc so there's a lot to learn here and JWST will be very important but to uh, we, we need to understand this famous universal pie yeah now we astrophysicists sort of think we we are so smart etc in the end as you probably know we understand about four or five percent of the universe all the rest we call dark energy dark matter for want of a better name we have no clue of what they are not not not, a, not an idea at all okay so let's try and, uh, and consider how ignorant we are we spent two 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 thousand years working on astronomy we now have some grasp of less than five percent of the of the universe uh, they still have a, a lot to be discovered out there and uh, here we, we believe that Euclid uh, will be fundamental in going back <coughs> towards the beginning of time to understand this universal pile uh, i.e. the role of dark energy and dark matter <coughs> which is the next huge discovery awaiting probably the next generation of astronomers here in the, in the audience I personally believe that this, if we do this, will be the end of electromagnetic astronomy, as I call it, in the sense that we'll have explored the whole universe from now until the wall of the 380,000 years of the microwave background. But it's not just electromagnetic astronomy. This is an important point. The celestial objects send us messages mostly through electromagnetic waves, but also cosmic rays or meteorites etc but also something which is not electromagnetic for example neutrinos neutrinos have the advantages they go straight unfortunately they're very difficult to catch because they're extremely penetrating etc um, they are best detected in Antarctica in this object called ice cube as actually it is an ice cube of uh, one kilometer size so it's a huge ice cube it would be a bit difficult to bring Antarctica into space. So I believe, unfortunately, <coughs> neutrino astronomy per se will have to stay on the ground, but it would be useless neutrino astronomy per se if we could not find the counterparts, uh, the objects from which neutrinos come, if we detect them. And for this, we need space astronomy to localize neutrino sources once we find them. We already have one source, Supernova 1987A, which was easy to detect because the signal came exactly at the time of a supernova. But we are on the brink of detecting objects, and then we need electromagnetic astronomy, surely from space, to understand what kind of objects we are talking about. And then, of course, gravitational waves. Uh, this is the other huge non-electromagnetic signal. Uh, here, for example, we see what happens to the metric of space-time when two uh, neutron stars collapse into forming a black hole you see there's a huge perturbation of the metric as Einstein had predicted and gravitational waves sort of start moving around um, we are planning LISA there again there's a long wait to, to LISA because in an extremely challenging extremely difficult mission <coughs> to, to, to build but we are very optimistic however if we manage to, to do everything correct and have LISA up on time etc still the need to localize gravitational wave sources through space or strong because the information uh, uh, okay I found the gravitational wave great you have a ticket to Stockholm you get Nobel Prize but still astronomers will want to know where did it come from and this can only be done through classical space uh, astronomy and finally we get to see our universe close to the Big Bang huh? uh, this this funny funny picture here uh, explains the fact that the, we've just discovered this universe does not expand as we thought in the, the nice Big Bang theory it accelerates it bursts of acceleration it did a burst of acceleration 
very very soon at Big Bang plus 10 to the minus 35 seconds and then lo and behold about 8 billion years after the Big Bang it started accelerating again and now we see it is, the, the expansion is accelerating uh, with, for, for this it needs a huge energy, the famous dark energy and we don't know why, we do not understand it. Okay, so you will all uh, be revealed these mysteries when you come to, to Moscow, the General Assembly. I am very, very happy to tell you that uh, this is all the preparations are on time, and in fact, uh, it was uh, confirmed personally to me by your friend uh, President Putin here <laughs> in, in a meeting. And he, he called me to, to Moscow to make sure that uh, Kospa. Was, was happy and willing and I assured him and, and he assured COSPA that there will be no problem at all in hosting all visitors from all over the world in Moscow and we were talking to the astronauts here on the, on the space station in the new uh, Moscow Space Museum which is really very beautiful if you, uh, some of you may have visited it, it's really very, very nice. Okay, thank you very much. very much for a wonderful tour <laughs> around the universe. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay. Hello. <laughs> Someone. The, these are the books you should read. Yeah. Yeah. So. I wonder if there are some people still trying to contact uh, these new planets by radio waves. Yes, <coughs> more or less. In other words, in other words, the SETI project and uh, search for extraterrestrial um, intelligence <coughs> is still going on. Unfortunately, uh, with the official lack of public support, at least in the United States, um, we in in Europe do something different. For example. In Italy, we have just built a new huge radio telescope in, in Sardinia, 64 meter antenna with, the, with uh, adaptive optics, which allows uh, an excellent focusing. Yeah? And we have decided to devote a certain amount, tiny, a small amount of time to SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which means, among else, to point this telescope, for example, at a given star. Uh, the, the problem is well, what to do with it so in order to raise funds and I suggest this may interest you too in order to raise funds I have started a campaign within Italy send a message to our neighbours namely I have uh, advertised that I shall point the uh, telescope to the position in the sky where a nearby star for example Tau Ceti which is one of the nearby stars to the position of the sky where Tau Ceti will be 30 years from now. 30 years is the time the signal takes to get there. So if you send the signal now in that position, the people in Tau Ceti will get it. Uh, you'd be surprised in how many people have actually sent in messages to be sent in whatever language, in whatever language. Yeah? And uh, so I have promised that for a modest fee, one euro or something, the message they have sent will be encoded into bits and sent to the position in the sky where Tau Ceti will be uh, at the appropriate time. This is all we can do. Uh, in reality, it's much better if they transmit to us 